All right, so Flat Earth with Zach and Karen B. Let's just go straight into it. Okay, let's move to his third proof. If you want to say Earth is flat, then, for example, lunar eclipses. Oh. And if you see the shape of Earth's shadow on the moon, it is always round. Always round. If Earth were flat, sometimes you get like a flat shadow. Right. And we've never seen a flat shadow. Right. So the only thing that makes a perfect circle shadow every single time is a perfect sphere. Right. Okay? No matter what angle no matter you shot. Whereas a disc, it would only make a perfect circle if you lined it that way. Right. And so then you have to look at the face of the disc in order to get the circle. So Neil deGrasse Tyson is trying to tell us that if you see a shadow on any object in the sky, it means that it's the Earth shadow. Well, he didn't really assert that it had to be the Earth's shadow, although I, I guess he did assume. But it is kind of odd how the lunar eclipse only happens when the sun is opposite the moon. There's not a whole lot else it could be. And that, of course, proves the shape of the Earth. If the shadow is round, then the Earth is a sphere. And if it's flat, then the Earth is flat. Thank you, Neil. I didn't know your best proof would be that ridiculous. That's ridiculous? You guys are the one that said NASA should uh, shoot a laser parallel to the ground so that the laser would bend around the globe and come back to itself, which isn't how it works, by the way. And, and this is ridiculous. See, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he doesn't exactly follow all the intricacies of the Flat Earth hypotheses and respond to them on a regular basis like I do. Instead, he's trying to uh, educate and explain the actual model of the universe and give some basic proofs that the Earth is indeed a globe. First off, we never said that the flat Earth can go between the moon and the sun. So the shadow you see on the moon is not the Earth's shadow. And it could be anything else. It could be a shadow that is coming from the moon itself. Why do we even call it a shadow? What if there is a light in the center of the moon that turns around and around? We know that the lunar eclipse is caused by the Earth's shadow because at times it appears rough and not a perfect circle. And this is because the moon's surface is rough, what with mountains and craters. We also know because of the blood moon, that is, that the moon turns red during the lunar eclipse. And this is caused by the Earth's atmosphere scattering light, which allows red light to bleed through, so to speak. This is the same sort of effect that causes the sunset and sunrise to be red. So there we go, a perfectly reasonable explanation of this on the globe Earth. I don't think that your siren or lighthouse hypothesis has a very good explanation of this. Nor do I think that you can explain just how and why this siren appears to match up perfectly with the moon's location relative to the sun and the earth. Is that just a coincidence? Why would it be that way if the location of the moon, sun, and earth has no effect? What if there is another object that is eclipsing the moon like in the solar eclipse when the moon eclipses the sun, Mr. Neil? Why does it have to be the Earth? Because it matches the calculations of the globe model? No, it's because it only occurs when the sun is opposite the moon. And if it was some other body periodically obstructing the moon, then it would have to be in front of the stars, too but we don't see it obstructing the stars, unless it's behind the stars, but then the stars would have to be in front of the moon, so we would see stars in front of the moon, which we don't. So... Not only that, but we can still see the parts of the moon that are in the shadow, it's just darker because it's just a shadow. And we've never observed this other body in the sky, ever. I mean, in order for you to say that this is what explains lunar eclipses, then you gotta show us that this thing is actually up there in the sky. And and if you do that, that'll actually give your model some, some predictive power, instead of just looking like ad hoc hypotheses over and over. Uh, but until you can prove that there is this other heavenly body that is in front of the moon and behind the stars, 
and only seen on a lunar eclipse, but like translucent, transparent, translucent. I'm not, I'm not going to believe it. I have no reason to. That's not a reasonable explanation. Why does it have to be the Earth? Because it matches the calculations of the globe model? So if we make different calculations that match with reality, can we just assume that our model is the truth? We didn't come up with the calculations before we made the model. We made our observations and then made a model that closely resembles reality. Now from there, you can use that model and try to predict things, and if those predictions turn out to be true, then that further backs up the model because it has predictive ability. And we've actually done that with things like the discovery of Neptune, and also with uh, general relativity and uh, how it bends light. It's also worth mentioning that calculations based on the flat Earth map don't match up to reality. Fancy that. Uh, this includes uh, angles between locations on the ground, as well as the angles of the sun and the sky, and even flight paths. And there's more I could go on, but you get the point. Why don't we have a full video from space when this eclipse happens, Mr. Neil? Where are these videos? We can't find them in your websites or in any other websites. We only find cartoons. Is that how you prove something scientifically with calculations and cartoons? Come on, Neil. We thought you were smarter than that. We do have images from Kaguya and Messenger. That's the satellites, not the Facebook kind. Um, now, these don't seem to be high quality, but I guess it doesn't matter because it's not like you'd accept any evidence anyway. We do have one video from Kaguya, uh, but there isn't a whole lot of footage out there because we don't really have much reason to take it in the first place. I mean, what purpose would it serve? Again, uh, space agencies aren't out there to prove themselves to you. They have far more important things to worry about than to argue with people who are hundreds, no, 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 scratch that, thousands of years behind science. The ancient Greeks figured this out. Nowhere did he say that we do have footage of the lunar eclipse from space, and the cartoons that you mentioned aren't there to be passed off as genuine footage. They aren't there to prove that this happens, they're there for a demonstration. Not everything is about you. Look how ridiculous your claim is. Even if you orientate the flat disk like this, the shadow will always be curved. It will only be flat on a flat surface. Right, because this looks exactly like what we see during a lunar eclipse. But again, this is not even what we say, Mr. Neil. We are just playing with your theories. OMG, Neil. I am so disappointed. You sound like a cantankerous teenager. I just learned that word not too long ago. Cantankerous? I was excited to use it. It sounds funny. But you sound like an annoying teenager, or... Maybe more like a preteen for that matter. Anyway, let's move to the fourth proof. So now that the Earth is round, how big is Earth? Mm -hmm. You might want to check for that. There was a famous experiment conducted by Eratosthenes. Turns out we can't see the bottom of both wells at the same time. Turns out with just two wells, there's enough wiggle room for both explanations to fit our observations. Eratosthenes only had two wells. But what if he had added a third? With a third well, it doesn't matter where the sun is. No flat Earth model can explain the angles of all three shadows. But the spherical model explains it all. All three angles with ease. So you are saying that Eratosthenes should have at least used three wells to confirm the shape of the Earth. But why didn't he do it? Was it so hard to do? He wasn't trying to prove the shape of the Earth. All he was doing was measuring the Earth's circumference. And he was doing that because he already believed that the Earth was a globe, as educated Greeks did at that time, because they had already proven it by then. Thousands of years ago. Anyway, he did it or not, he is already debunked. Here is a video that I made before you even made this interview to debunk Eratosthenes' method. Check it out and tell me if the flatter model still doesn't work. 
Okay, I'm not going to bother with that video because it's like 40 minutes long, but uh, let me just explain to you why this wouldn't work on the flat Earth, okay? Say that the sun is right above the equator, and on that spot on the equator, the sun looks directly up, right? But say on the North Pole, the sun looks pretty close to the horizon, pretty close to 90 degrees. That would mean that the sun would have to be pretty low to the ground, relatively speaking. But on any points on Earth between those two, like in the US and Mexico, it doesn't look close to the ground at all. It looks way higher up than that. Zach's experiment, in fact, proved that Eratosthenes' experiments require a second look. There are at least two possible ways to make the angles of elevation work. The first possible way is what the globe model is, a curved land and parallel sun rays. And the second possible way is a flat land and a curved sky and refracted sun rays. This doesn't make any sense either. There's no way that this could make the sun appear as it does. There's no way that this could make the sun appear close to the horizon at the north and south poles. The, the angle of this domed atmosphere couldn't bend light that much. There's no way the light could bend that much, especially at the south pole. Eratosthenes chose the first option without considering the effect of the atmosphere, like the atmosphere didn't exist at that time. Now, no modern science agrees that the atmosphere works as a lens, but in the meantime, it agrees with Eratosthenes' experiment. These are two very different ways of thinking, and we cannot have it both ways. If science agrees that refraction changes the sun's position, then science is admitting that there is no way they can triangulate the sun from Earth. Therefore, the distance to the sun and the size of it should remain unknown. While it's true that the atmosphere does bend light, it's not an extreme amount, and that doesn't make the atmosphere a lens, and it also doesn't make it impossible to measure the angle of the sun in the sky. Atmospheric refraction has less and less effect the higher up in the sky the object is, whatever it is. And besides, that's not how we tell the solar distance anyway. The first reasonably accurate measurement was actually made by measuring the parallax between two points on Earth when uh, Venus passed in front of the Sun. But nowadays, we use radar to measure the distance between us and another planet, and then use their position and trigonometry to determine the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So, in the future, try to learn and actually know the things that you're talking about before you start to argue with it. So, by just adding a concave lens above the flat Earth, it made all angles of elevation work perfectly just like they work on the globe. But now, you are going to say that there is no dome above us. But I'm not even saying that there is a dome. I am just saying that the atmosphere could be working like the concave lens. A concave lens? That makes even less sense. How is this supposed to act like a concave lens? How? What about this domed atmosphere is concave? I... it's baffling, really. So we did long distance laser tests to see how refraction works on the air and we discovered that it bends the light upwards instead of downwards. So we have proved with the experiments that the atmosphere can bend the light upwards, which means that the sunlight can be bent in the opposite direction like I showed in this experiment. And that will make the flat earth model important, because you assume that when the apparent sun is above the horizon line, the real sun is already below it. But our experiments prove the opposite. The apparent sun that you claim it's above the real sun during sunset or sunrise, now it would be below the real sun. And <laughs> that means your entire model is debunked. I don't see how. All you did was show that light can bend upwards, not that it always does. See, atmospheric refraction varies depending on, uh, see, temperature gradient, air pressure, humidity. In general, if the ground, or water I suppose, is warmer than the air above it, then yeah, light will bend upwards. But if the ground is colder than the air above it, then light will bend downwards. 
Though I am glad that some flat earthers are actually acknowledging that atmospheric refraction is a thing. So we have that, at least. Anyhow, that's it for this section of their video, and I'm pretty sure I hit the 10 minute mark. So, uh, thank you for watching. Video's over. Goodbye.